Hi there and welcome to GMI, the Guitar and Music Institute, podcast number 19. Oral training and the ability to hear what you actually play is a crucial and much needed skill that all musicians should possess. Unfortunately, for a lot of musicians, it's the last thing they think of. And for musical establishments whose budgets are being tightened all the time, it does seem that oral training has been pushed to the end of the queue in many cases, and in terms of school provision, it's not very good either. That's why I was so interested to talk with Christopher Sutton of Musical U. Christopher is not actually a professional musician, but has always loved music, and played many different instruments with his computing background saw a gap in the market which he has more than adequately filled with his company Musical U. Over the interview that follows I'm going to be talking about the inspiration that led him to actually create the company, the products that the company creates and the reception from people all around the world. If you're listening to this podcast on iTunes please subscribe and it would be great if you enjoy this podcast if you leave a review for us. Regardless of what download site you're listening to this podcast on, I would encourage you to come over to GMI's actual website, which is www.guitarandmusicinstitute.com. There are lots of additional resources such as videos, web links, etc., to each of the podcasts that you hear. So, for the next 35 minutes or so, I'm going to be talking to Christopher Sutton, who's all the way in Mexico City. Another first for my podcasting career. Get the seatbelt on and here it comes now. Christopher, it's great to talk to you at last. It seems ages I've been waiting for this interview. How are you? I'm well, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, you're all the way in Mexico, is that right? That's right, yes, Mexico City. How is it? Is it warm over there? It's actually really nice. So it's a bit up in the mountains, which means you get sunshine, but it doesn't get too hot. Um, So for someone who grew up in the grimy London weather, as I did, it's actually really nice to have sunshine every day. So, uh, mathematics and music. Discuss. Do you think there's there's a a real synergy between mathematicians and musicians, uh, mathematics and music? It's an interesting question. I think um, my own personal experience with it, I suppose, is that I am a very mathematically minded person. Uh, My degree was in computer science. I was always a computer geek and developing computer programs and that kind of thing throughout my life. And so I'm very much approaching music normally from that scientific mindset and thinking about theory and the logic and, you know, intervals and how it all fits together. And I think what's been really interesting for me with my work over the last decade is kind of filling in the other side of things. You know, I think if you take too mathematical an approach to music, it can become very dry and methodical and lose a lot of the exciting spirit that makes music so wonderful. And so I think for me, it's been a a process of learning that balance to take advantage of the mathematical logic that exists in music while still remembering that it is a creative art. I was going to say, so you're you're more from the Scandinavian school. (laughs) Cold (laughs) hearted, but very technical. (laughs) <laughs> I guess so. Um, now, the, the reason I ask that is because um, would it be fair to say that you're not a professional musician? Would that be a fair thing to say? It would, yeah. And I, I hopefully always make that clear um, when presenting myself as the founder of Musical U because I am not a recording artist. I'm not a you know, polished pro who's giving gigging every weekend. I am very much one of the kinds of people we help to teach. You know, I was very musical growing up in the sense that I learned several instruments. I reached a high level in the grade exams. I was in choirs and orchestras and wind bands and other bands. Um, but at the same time, music was not my career path. And so my my training was more on the technical side, technology and computer programming. And at this point, I still consider myself an amateur musician. Well, that's really interesting because... When I started uh, doing some background on you, uh, looking at your company and looking at what you'd done, um, I think it's really bizarre in a sense that someone who's not a musician or not a professional musician should actually see that one of the big ailments in musical education these days is the lack of oral training. Uh, I went to uh, England for three years to do my musical education and every single week we were given an hour's oral training. 
And that has kind of disappeared because of cuts and all the rest of it. I just find it really interesting that you spotted, as someone who wasn't playing all the time, a gap in the market. How did, how did that come about, Christopher? It came about partly through my own experience and partly through talking to musicians over the years, both professional who had had that kind of music degree or conservatory training and those who were more self-taught or just having instrument lessons. And, you know, I mentioned there I was learning a lot of instruments in my school days and in through my 20s. And my experience of oral skills was totally limited to the oral skills bit of the exam. You know, that was all it meant to me. And that meant, despite spending hours and years training as a musician, I really didn't know how to play by ear or improvise or write my own music. And I always assumed that was just because I didn't have the gift, <laughs> because no one had actually explained to me, you know, oral skills are learnable. And these weird interval things we've been teaching you for the exams actually are what let you do those amazing creative things in music. And so I suppose I assumed that people were either talented or not, and those who could do it had the gift, and I just didn't. But it was very late in my own music training, like mid-20s, before I realized actually there was this traditional area of ear training that had always been part of a conservatory or higher level music education that I had totally missed out on. And when I talked to people, I realized that was really consistent, like 99% of musicians had had that same experience. Yeah, well, I mean, I find it amazing that you, you put your finger right on the pulse because... You know, music is a language and learning to speak that language and hearing it in your head, you know, those noises in your head is, is really quite important, you know, and then transferring that as opposed to the other way of playing something and reacting to it from what you've physically done. Absolutely. And I think it's a blessing and a curse that so many instruments like piano or guitar even, they let you get away with not realizing that. You know, you can sit down at a piano keyboard, look at the notes on a page and hit the right buttons on the piano, basically, and create music. And you can reach a very high level on any instrument. You can pass your grade eight without ever really having the inner understanding of what those notes on the page should sound like before you hit the buttons. And I think that really leaves a lot of us missing out and kind of I, I feel we should be a bit more resentful of the fact that we can spend so much time and energy learning the instrument and still never really feel like a musician and still never really get the benefits of that kind of musicality training that lets you actually understand the notes you're playing. Well I'll, I'll tell you a wee story. I was actually talking to a member, second violins of a, a world famous orchestra in the break and this person told me that she had started playing the guitar and I said oh great how are you getting on and she says oh I'm I just totally at sea I don't know anything about chords or arpeggios <laughs> anything and I just you've got to be joking me you you know you're you're reciting in a sense uh, incredible things off the page and you can't hear a thing it's amazing and it's so sad in a way because I think People don't know what they're missing out on, and they think it's a failure of them. They think if you know they don't have that instinct for music theory, or they don't have that ability to improvise or play by ear, that's just part of who they are and part of what they can't do. And I think it should really be a core part of music education, at the very least, to explain to people those are learnable skills. These are things that every musician can learn to do. And then I think we see a lot more people putting a bit of time into that side of things and feeling a lot more. I don't know, autonomous is the word I often think of, like someone who actually has control over what they're doing and is making conscious decisions rather than just playing the notes that are put in front of them. Yes, it's not a, a reactive process, and, and, that, and that beds right through to composition. And in a sense, what you're training people to do is to see into the future musically by and, and also to create the longevity of a line because, you know, most students can write two or three notes, but if they're not really hearing it, after two or three bars, they dry up because they can't create the longevity of the line. Yeah, it's a lot about the skill of audiation, the imagining of music in your mind, which obviously is a bit related to musical memory, but it's also about being able to conjure up your own musical ideas. And if you don't have that skill of audiation and a bit of ear training to analyze what you're hearing in your head and translate it onto your instrument, you really don't know what you're playing until you play it. And so you can I really rely don't on know what you're talking. What was that word you used? Okay. That was excellent. Audiation. 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 Never heard that one before, but I can do it. Well, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you'd be familiar with the concept, if not the word. And 
you know, without that, you can get quite far with, say, fretboard patterns. If you're a guitarist wanting to play a rock solo, you know that the minor pentatonic is going to serve you well. You can noodle around on that. It'll probably sound okay. And you can learn various technique to sound better and better. But you still generally are not going to know what your solo will sound like until you play it. And that can actually be very limiting and a bit scary, I think, for a lot of guitarists to not be really choosing what they play, except in a very dry, logical way. I just think it's incredible talking to you, Christopher, that you're not a professional musician, but you've got so much down. that is, It's just quite incredible as a person that you've done this, almost like it chose you as opposed to you choosing it. Would you like to comment on that? Well, I I think there's that Steve Jobs quote about only being able to join up the dots looking backwards. And I think there are def- definitely parts of my journey where that applies. So for example, for a long time, I felt very guilty that I was kind of a jack of all trades when it came to instruments. And, you know, I could play clarinet and saxophone and piano and guitar, and I could sing and I took up harmonica and I could play bass and I could reach, you know, a, a decent standard. I could sit in with a group and, and do a decent job of it on each of those. But I always felt a bit guilty because I hadn't kind of picked one and really mastered it and gone to the pro level. And looking back, that's really been a blessing because it means I can see the commonalities between all of them. And when someone comes to me playing a particular instrument, whether it's wind or strings or brass or um, a keyboard instrument, I can relate to them and I understand you know, enough about playing that instrument to really help them with their musicality training. So there are a few things like that where you know, for a long time it felt like I was doing it wrong because I hadn't gone the pro musician route. But looking back, I think I'm much better positioned to do what I do now because I have more of a kind of jack of all trades amateur experience as a musician. And are you still playing? And and if you are, what do you play? Um, I am absolutely still playing. Although, because we've been traveling a lot, I am sadly without a piano, which was my primary instrument for a few it's years a bit there. hard taking that up a mountain there. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit trickier, yeah. Um, so actually, these days I play mostly bass, and I'm playing a Carla U-Bass, which I don't know if you know or the listeners know, but it's a, a ukulele-sized bass, so it's the right pitch for a, for a proper bass guitar. And you're and in Mexico. And wacky. Hmm? And you're in Mexico. Yeah, exactly. It works well. Um, so that's a great instrument for traveling with. And I've been taking lessons with, um, a guy called Steve Lawson, who's an incredible bassist. And we do that over Skype so I can keep up my skills. Fantastic. Would it be fair to say that you love music or is this a means to an end? I I don't expect an honest answer here, but (laughs) go for it. Oh, you can have the honest answer. The honest answer is I absolutely love music. And although my training was on the technical side, music has always been my passion and my hobby. So, you know, I think if you talk to the heads of music education companies, they will probably all tell you there's not a lot of money in music education. You know, <laughs> if you want to start a business for the sake of business success, there are better industries to work in. For me, it was very much a, a passion project back in 2009 that gathered a bit more steam as I realized this pain point for me was really something a lot of musicians were going through. Okay. And I saw. Uh, can, I, mm-hmm. can I just pick you up on that? Because I, I want to get sure. on to, to Musical You, because um, it seems to me, I mean, I've been working on the internet now for 10 years. In various guises, uh, and the last four years with GMI, the Guitar Music Institute, it seems looking at your model, if you want, it's perfect because the internet seems to work best when there's just one point of attack, when it's really, really focused. You're really, really focused on one thing, and that is oral training. And I just couldn't believe the scale of what you've achieved. (laughs) It's just absolutely astonishing. Talk about tapping into an unknown market, which really is there and a need. Thanks. Yeah, well, it's been a twisty, turny journey. Um, It certainly wasn't an overnight success that came easy. But I'm super proud and astonished of the number of people we've managed to reach. You know, I think at at this point, we've had over 4 million people come to our websites. We're reaching 150,000 every month. And that blows my mind a bit. You know, we can't as humans really imagine that many people. Totally with Um, you there, It's phenomenal. So, yeah, I think we're doing our part to hopefully make, get this message out there that the skills you might assume you need a gift or a talent to do are learnable. And we're trying to provide the most effective and enjoyable methods to develop those skills. So when you started Musical You Off, who were you talking to? It was all your own ideas or did you immediately go to music professionals to get some ideas of how you should go about it? Tell me about the start and how, how things developed. 
Sure. So I have always been quick to acknowledge and try to fix my own limitations. You know, as we've talked about, I'm an amateur. I don't consider myself a, a traditional music educator, and I have great respect for those who are trained in that. And so the company started with a hobby project developing iPhone apps for a particular kind of ear training. And that I knew enough about and I had the technology skills to kind of do it myself. I just, you know, for the first year or so, the company was me <laughs> and we had a product or two that I had developed. But when we started making a little bit of money with those apps, I really wanted to do more and do bigger. And in particular, I looked around and there were almost no websites really devoted to that back in 2009. You know, if you search for ear training, you'd find a little widget here or a, a page on a website there. But there was no real home for ear training online. And having seen how powerful this method could be, I found that really bizarre. Um, and so I started plowing the money we were making back into developing a website. And so I was going out and hiring the best music educators I could find who knew about this subject, whether it was, you know, audio frequency training or learning solfege and intervals or what it means to play by ear or start to improvise. And I was commissioning them to write really great tutorials to go on this website um, so that even if people never saw our iPhone apps, they could find us online and learn about this. So so what was on what was in the apps? How big were the apps to begin with? So the main app we did for those first few years was called Relative Pitch, and it was about interval recognition. And so for the listeners, if you're familiar with the guitar fretboard, you probably know the idea of a half step and a whole step and each fret on your fretboard is a half step. And that means you can start to think very kind of geometrically about the gaps between notes. And you know that, you know, the strings are five frets apart or four in one case. And that can kind of empower you to play solos or figure out things by ear. But the trick is really to train your ear so that you know what two notes a certain distance apart will sound like. So and you use know, that whole thing with the uh you know, learning a tune like Here Comes a Bride and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, that's what I would call the reference songs method. And it's where a lot of people start and stop with interval training. It's a really great way to get started. And if you just want to pass your oral skills segment of the exam, it's a great way to go. The trouble with that method is it doesn't really go beyond just two notes. Yeah. So if you are trying to do a melody, it's really hard to remember Here Comes the Bride in the middle of a rock guitar solo, right? And so what we found is there are actually three methods for interval recognition. The first is that reference songs method, which is great to get started with. But from there, you can also use the solfa approach, which is about learning to recognize the different degrees of the scale. And you can number them one to eight, or you can call them do, re, mi. It doesn't much matter. But that can be a really good way to internalize the sounds of the intervals. And the third method, which I hope Nike is never going to sue me for, but I call the just do it method. Um, <laughs> which is essentially just repeated drills to learn the exact sound of each interval. And interestingly, each interval kind of has a characteristic sound. You know, the classic example is that a major third sounds bright and happy, and a minor third sounds kind of gloomy and dark. And those kinds of descriptions only get you so far. But the point is your ear is quite good at picking up that different character of each interval. And over time with that method, you can get very, very versatile and very, very fast so that you can actually apply it to figure out a melody by ear or to choose the notes for your improvisation. What I like about your descriptions, Christopher, is that there's a lot of caveats in there. And when I'm teaching people, there always has to be caveats because it's, it's not people say sad songs are in a minor key. Uh, happy songs are in a major key but of course that just isn't true for all songs so absolutely the, the caveats have to be poured in there if you know what you're doing and it, it obviously it sounds like you know what you're doing which is why you've got a massive successful company sorry carry on sorry i was just going to say that that's definitely part of the approach we try and take and i think it's so easy to go out there and find music websites that will sell you an easy solution and kind of sell you on easy overnight success. And if you just learn this one trick, you've got it. And I've, I've always really shied away from that because I think it's so misleading to musicians. The reality is, yes, these skills are learnable and yes, they're incredibly powerful and satisfying. But like any skill in life, they do take practice, they do take time, and you need to really understand the learning journey you're on if you want to have success with it. So we try and give the, the useful shortcuts or tips and tricks, but always with uh, an, expl an explanation of this will only get you so far or this is just the first step. Okay, and have you found as you've developed these different programs that you're actually, there's different stresses depending on what instrument someone wants to learn? To some extent. So the beautiful thing about listening skills 
And the reason that looking back, playing a bunch of instruments seems to make sense for me is that the inner skills of music are actually really common across instruments. You know, if you can analyze music you hear by ear and understand these are the notes being played, these are the chords being played, it's very easy to then pick up an instrument and do it. The, what we do find differs a lot between instruments is what people want to do. So for example, we'll have a guitar player join Musical U and all they want to do is improvise rock solos. But we'll have another one who actually plays acoustic guitar in a folk band and he really wants to be able to go along to the jam session and figure out the chords by ear, which is a related but quite different skill. And then we'll have a trumpet player who is, you know, doing advanced jazz and really needs that interval recognition to be perfectly dialed in can play exactly the right note at the right time. Um, So it's more the goals, I think, that vary across instruments. And often we can find commonalities in the actual training they do. Okay, so how is Musical U developing then? You seem to have so many people taking the programs and I guess you're getting a lot of feedback from that and you're able to develop the programs in accordance to that feedback as well as your own direction, yes? Definitely. So Musical U as a a product, a membership site, an all-in-one solution, only launched two years ago. So the company has been going since 2009. We've been developing products, developing training material, and improving it based on that kind of feedback for several years now. But it was only a couple of years ago that we actually launched Musical U and said, here is one place you can come to learn all of these skills. And so what we found is our training material is actually pretty well dialed in. You know, it works well, we get results, people enjoy using it. What has been really challenging is actually what we just touched on there, that each person arriving at Musical U has a different musical background, they might have a different level of theory, and in particular, they really have different goals in their musical life. And so we tried to develop a training system that was very personalizable and flexible, so that if someone comes in and they want to do a particular path towards a goal, they can still draw on this same bank of training modules, but in a way that makes perfect sense for them. And that worked quite well when we launched. I'd like to think it works a lot better now, but it is a continual process for us of learning from members coming in, finding the right training modules, and how we help them maximize their results to get to those goals they really care about. And have you found, Christopher, there's been a certain resistance because it's on the internet or even snobbery from certain sections of musical education, or is it? are they totally behind you? Talk about a leading question. <laughs> I think, actually, what I love about music teachers is that they love what they do. And they do it, you know, like I said before, there's not a lot of money in music education. These people aren't in it to make the big bucks. They're in it because they love music and they love teaching people music. And so I've had the pleasure of talking to some of the top people in music education in various countries over the last several years, as well as just independent instrument teachers. They're generally very positive and they're positive because they know this is a big pain point and a big missing part of traditional music education. And in, on the whole, they're very welcoming of anybody who comes in and tries to improve that status quo. If someone joins Musical U, how does the, the workflow go? So we have an onboarding process which walks you through what we feel are really essential steps. You know, it would be easy to set up a website where you arrive and on day one we throw some intervals at you and on day two we throw some chords at you and for a week you feel like you're making progress because you passed these tests but in reality they're not helping you get towards the goal you really care about. And so we've made sure even though it's a little harder work to begin with or it requires a bit more of the member joining we walk you through really thinking through what it is you care about. Like, what is your five-year vision for where you want to get to? What parts of your musical life are going to be improving or expanding? What skills do you need to put in place to actually, you know, join the jam session or start the band or feel confident as a singer? And then from there, we work back and we say, okay, these are the skills. Here are the training modules in the right order that are going to help you gradually develop those skills in the months ahead. And from there, it's a matter of showing up each day and doing the next step of your training plan. You've got a whole bunch of stuff there and you're tailor you're, it's almost bespoke for an individual. It's as bespoke as they want it to be, basically. So that initial setup process is total custom. They have to write a description of their goals, and that means they get real clarity on what they're there for and what they want to accomplish at Musical U. And from there, if they want to do it fully customized and pick out the right training modules and construct their own training plan, they're fully welcome to do so. And some people who come in definitely want to do it that way. Other people come in and they want to be guided, and that's totally understandable. 
And so for them, we have a, a set of roadmaps. For example, we have a roadmap for playing chords by ear, and we have another roadmap for learning to sing in tune. And they can select one of those roadmaps, and then it's kind of mapped out for them. And they can tweak it if needed, if they know they've already mastered that, or they have no interest in this, they can adjust it. But it gives them that kind of clear sense of where they're going and how to get there. Sing in tune. Don't you just switch the vocoder on, no? <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're, if auto tune becomes more popular, we're out of business. So, so um, how long does a program last, Christopher? How long have you got your hooks in them? Well, it depends. It's a bit like asking how long does it take to learn guitar. You know, you can say it takes a year, but. It- you're putting an arbitrary line in the sand there. And for the people who really love this and the people who are getting results, it's a lifelong process. And so the more useful answer I can give you is if you want to learn a skill like playing chords by ear, if you want to be able to hear a pop song and strum the right chords on your guitar, and you're starting more or less from scratch, maybe you have a bit of guitar ability, but no listening skills, we can generally help you get there in a few months. It's that kind of time scale. And obviously, if you want to do all of our roadmaps and develop all of the possible listening skills to the highest possible level, it's more a journey of years. So um, everybody's a winner these days. Um, Do they get a big shiny certificate at the end of it all? (laughs) Uh, We're actually a bit careful. We do have people asking, do you issue credentials? And I'm always a bit curious to know why they care so much. But because we call ourselves Musical U, it's kind of hinting at being a university. But obviously, we're not an actual university. And I don't want anyone to get misled on that front. And so we don't issue certificates or credentials of any kind. We do, however, reward progress in very visible, tangible ways. So everyone wants to know they're making progress. And our training is very interactive. So rather than just saying, go away and study this and come back when you've mastered it, you're actually on the site each day, passing quizzes, improving your scores, getting a badge or an award when you get to a certain level. And so it's very easy to see clearly, yes, I'm making progress. And these are the areas I'm improving on. So is it kind of like, are you using kind of a sensei type approach? It's a bit like that, yeah. We use a system called LearnDash, in fact, oh, with right. a lot of customization and uh, a plugin called BadgeOS that lets us do yes. kind of rewards and gamification. I know that. Uh, for l- the listeners, it's uh, they're called LMSs, Learning Module Systems or something like that. I actually had that on GMI, but I took, I took the badges off because... Uh, not enough people were getting to the end of the courses. <laughs> so, well, um, sorry, carry on. No, I was just going to say that touches on what I was saying before about the challenges of Musical U. And it's a really subtle thing to provide people with the right pace of feedback and the right tangible signs of their progress. That's something that we're definitely continuing to work on because one person loves getting five badges today for what they did and another person thinks that's totally ridiculous and they just want to get on with the training. And so that is something, yeah have to kind of experiment with and, and gradually improve over time, we found. I've got to say, Christopher, it's very uh, heartwarming in a sense that people are dedicating themselves to it, especially when there's no pressure and they're not, they don't feel obligated other than, I guess, the money they pay because it seems to me that so much online is sort of leading a charge towards cherry-picking, taking a bit of this and a bit of that. I'm amazed you've got guitar play, a lot of young, young guitar players on it because the oral perception is not very high on young guitar players' lists of to-do. Would you like to maybe just talk about this cherry uh, cherry picking thing that's come... Maybe it's yeah. just because I'm getting on a bit, um, but it seems <laughs> to me that that's how things are working there. Yeah, I think you're right. You're definitely right about that being the kind of atmosphere of learning these days because so much is available on demand in little bite-sized chunks on YouTube. It's very easy, I think, for people to fall into the trap of quick fixes. And I want to learn that song, so I'll go to the tutorial for that song. And they can spend a year or more thinking they're making progress. But at the end of that year, all they can do is the very specific things they've taken tutorials on. And they lack that kind of big picture sense of, I want to develop these abilities as a musician. And I think, you know, we can't be too judgmental because as we talked about, a lot of people simply don't understand those skills are learnable. They don't know that they can develop the inner ability to play whatever song they want. And so when those bite-sized tutorials are available on demand, it's very easy to think that's the best way to do it. I think the challenge and the opportunity as we see it is to provide that kind of quick satisfaction and clear bite-sized learning progress, but in a system that is thought through and does give them that bigger picture progress and actually moves them towards developing as a musician, not just as a robot hitting the right buttons at the right time yeah I, I liked how you you started this off because i've always had a bee in my bonnet about people 
who say, oh, I'm tone deaf, me, I, I couldn't do it. And I just, it really always gets on my nerves that. It's because they're lazy and they don't want to actually, you know, engage perhaps. Or the other one is, oh, you're talented, as opposed to, there's a lot of work that's gone in to get to the X, Y, Z. So anyway, enough of me rambling. Uh, I wanted to ask you, has there been any great success stories or uh, students who have gone through Musical U and, and you've been a part of, of their success as musicians? We've definitely had a lot of success stories we're proud of. Maybe not in the sense of producing the next rock star. Um, you know, we're, we're not aiming to produce the next Joe Satriani or, you know, guitar rock hero. But where we see success is in what we call progress journals. So we have a system in the site where members can share how they're getting on and ask any questions they have and that kind of thing. And it's amazing. Every day we have comments from people who have had that kind of light bulb moment. And you can kind of, you can almost hear the joy as they type their message because something that was previously totally impenetrable to them and they thought they could never learn, something switched and their training suddenly has paid off. And, you know, that might be, we've had cases where they always thought they couldn't sing and now they've gone to a choir and nobody's batted an eyelid at the way they sing. Or they always wanted to write a song and for the first time they sat down and they actually imagined what they wanted to write and then were able to put it down with their instrument. And, you know, it's that kind of real world payoff that I think lights people up and that we love to see. And so that for me is the success story. I, I don't have that much interest in producing the next superstar sensation. But for me to know that we're reaching passionate amateur musicians and helping them have those kinds of breakthroughs, I, I love. Fantastic. And I was just thinking about profiling. You must know who your customers are. So are your customers uh, old ladies uh, around 65 with a, a tweed twin set who are a bit bored and have worked out how to use the computer, or are they people from all walks of life? <laughs> Not to lead the question at all. <laughs> it's funny, you touched on that a bit uh, earlier. You talked about us helping young people, and one of the big shocks with Musical U launching in 2015 was I had always had a sense that our demographic was quite young. And so particularly with our iPhone apps, we were reaching kind of that 16 to 25-year-old demographic. And... To some extent, that was true of our website, too. Our website skewed a little older, but typically, I was thinking we reach young musicians. With Musical U, honestly, our biggest demographic is kind of 40 to 65. It's a very adult community, and a lot of those people have been playing music their whole life, but they've suddenly discovered this part was missing, or they're coming to back to music in retirement, maybe, because they have a bit more time on their hands. And what we found is it doesn't matter that they're a bit older in terms of the technology. We try and make that easy. And it doesn't matter in terms of the learning speed. A lot of them come in worried that they're too old to learn new tricks. And that's just not the case. You know, these listening skills can develop very fast, whatever age you're at. And it's been fascinating for me to learn that what we're offering, for whatever reason, actually appeals to a slightly more mature musician who maybe has a bit more perspective and has learned over the years that there is a bigger picture to being a musician. It's not just about memorizing songs and perfecting your technique. And they want to become that kind of natural, free, confident musician instead of the one who's always a bit nervous to play because they might play a note wrong. That doesn't kind of surprise me, Christopher, that the demographic's slightly older. I'm just thinking about the young guys I've taught over the years. They want to play fast they, on the guitar. There's that sort of testosterone-filled need to, to and the last thing they're thinking about is the most important thing which is oral and sonic perception so I guess I'm, we're coming to the end of the interview and I just wanted to ask you a, a, a couple of things quickies one is maybe there isn't an average cost of musical you I don't know but but is there an average cost of musical you so we looked around and found that People spend a lot on this kind of training. You know, if you study at a proper music degree course where this is part of the syllabus, you're talking tens of thousands of pounds or dollars. If you look at ear training courses online, they typically run $100 up. And I really wanted to make sure this was something as accessible and useful to as many people as possible. And obviously, there's a trade-off. We need to be able to pay the bills and provide the kind of personal support we do inside Musical U. And what we've ended up with is a monthly subscription so that you're only paying for as long as it's useful to you rather than shelling out hundreds of pounds for a course and hoping it works out. And so we charge about $30 a month in US dollars. Very fair. I hope so. Well, for that, you get access to 45, I think, training modules. And I think what really sets us apart is actually 
the support and guidance we provide, you know, we're not just giving you this and expecting you to get on with it. We're there every day in the community helping out with questions and guiding people to make sure they keep moving forwards and really get the success they're hoping for. I've looked at Musical U's, uh, all the staff on it, they're, they're some great players, uh, really experienced and, and it's obvious that you actually care. I guess the final question is for you, Christopher, although no doubt another one will pop into my head once I've asked it, is... Uh, where next for Musical You? It's a great question. So we have two big areas we're continuing to develop. Uh, one is improvisation. As it stands, we have some great modules to help you with the core skills you need to improvise. But we only have one or two modules specifically about the act of improvising. And similarly for songwriting, it's a big hot topic for a lot of our members. But at the moment, the training we have kind of equips you to write songs, but we don't walk you through it. And so those are two areas we're really expanding in the months ahead. Another major development is just in the last few months, we added what we call instrument packs, which help you apply all of these inner skills directly on guitar, piano, bass, or when singing. And so we hired some fantastic pros to, to lead those instrument packs, and they're putting out new resources every month. And we're hoping to also expand to other instruments in the future. Well, that sounds really exciting. And uh, sorry, when will all this, is this already with us or is it rolling out? So the improv and songwriting modules are coming out over the course of this year. Um, we have several in development and they're rolling out month by month. The instrument packs for those four instruments, guitar, bass, piano and singing, are available today. And you get access to all of the previous resource packs month by month. And then each month we release a new one. And are the apps still going? Because I, I, I did listen to another podcast interview that you did. And it's, mm. it's not that you were down on them, but uh, I, I got the feeling <laughs> that you felt they were maybe financially not really worth a candle. Uh, well, they are worth a candle, quite a few candles, actually, probably about 4,000 <laughs> candles. But um, that, it, you know, it was, there was a lot of work going into that and development for maybe not a great return. That's a pretty good way to put it. Yeah, there are two big difficulties with the apps. And in my heart of hearts, as a programmer, I love the iOS platform, and I love developing apps. And I'm proud of what we've been able to accomplish, particularly with Relative Pitch and our Sing True app that helps people learn to sing. And those apps do still bring in a non-trivial amount of money each month, kind of a third of our revenue is coming from the apps. That said, we were really hitting diminishing returns in terms of the revenue possible. And obviously, that really limits the growth of the company in terms of taking on new projects or developing the apps further. And additionally, because we have this website that reaches so many more, we were hearing from people on Android that they wanted the apps but couldn't get them. And and so part of creating Musical U was really to provide a solution that was as effective as the apps, but usable on any phone, computer, internet tablet. And so for that reason, we're putting more of our focus on that Musical U platform than on the individual apps at this point. Fantastic. Well, for what it's worth, all the all the strength in the world to you because there is absolutely no doubt it's it's the most underrated and the most forgotten about aspect of being a musician. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And you're, you're filling a massive hole in music education, which, you know, in a lot of colleges and even in some universities, there's virtually no oral training given at all these days. It's just total, if I almost uh, mix in my metaphor, it was lip service almost. Which um, and, and that's why I'm going to make sure that people know about Musical You and uh, we keep getting the, the word out about your company and what you're doing, Christopher. Well, listen, it's been fantastic talking with you uh, all the way in Mexico. You're the first pe the first person I've uh, spoken to in Mexico, but you're not Mexican. So, uh, but I didn't fall into the trap of saying because I was telling my son I'm speaking to someone in Mexico but they're not speaking Mexican <laughs> <laughs> no. what are you up to the day then? Today I have been preparing for our podcast uh, we're launching a new podcast in September which I'm super excited about and I'm learning what you already know which is doing an interview is one thing but turning that into a final episode is a whole other task and so i'm doing a lot now with the episodes we've already recorded to make them ready for launch in yeah. september taking all the m's as and uh, <laughs> you know what i means out <laughs> exactly yeah well christopher thanks very much for being part the of pleasure it. is all mine as i was saying to you before we started i'm such a fan of everything you do at the guitar and music institute and i'm a, a listener of the gmi podcast so it's a real honor and a pleasure to be here with you today on that bombshell goodbye well, folks, a lot of negative things are said about the internet and definitely merited at times. 
However, I think and I hope you'll agree with me that one of the great benefits of the internet is that you can learn wherever you are, as long as you have access to computer and broadband. What Christopher Sutton is doing and has done is highly laudable and has to be commended. Musical You goes from strength to strength and I would urge anyone who's interested in music who hasn't had any oral training to go over to that website and to look at what they have to offer. It's incredibly good value for money and is backed up by some of the best professional musicians that you could care to be taught by. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please consider supporting us on our Patreon page, a link on the GMI website. So until the next time from me, Jed Brocky, it's bye for now.